Hey, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the Drummer's Education Connection. My name is Jeremy Steinkohler. I'm here not just with three of my great friends, but four of my really great friends. Uh, Bart Robley in Southern California, Ontario, Chip Ritter in Tucson, Arizona, Rick Stojak down in San Diego. We are the Drummer's Education Connection, and we're here every week, every Tuesday morning at 11 a.m. Pacific time to bring you discussions about drumming, education, performing, industry stuff, and also interviewing really, really great guests. And today, we are graced with the uh, presence of two of my favorite, favorite people, two of my favorite drummers, and just fantastic human beings and good, dear friends, Amy Molinelli and Lorca Hart. Welcome, you guys. Yeah. Welcome to the deck, guys. Thanks so much for coming on. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. So, Amy and Lorca are, are married, and uh, they are both professional percussionists and educators. Uh, Lorca has, has he's a freelance jazz drummer who's played in a ton of different projects. He has his own Lorca Hart trio, uh, but he's also played with people like Freddie Hubbard, Bobby Hutcherson. Uh, freelance um, jazz. What's that? Um, um, I'm, I'm spacing out. Huma Sakela. Thank you. Uh. Keep, keep them coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stanley Jordan, yeah. Aaron Lawrence. Read us yeah. off your resume, yeah. would you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Jeff Goldblum, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and Amy is a, a, a mostly a, a percussionist. He plays uh, all different types of uh, drum percussion instruments, but your main instrument is the pandeiro, the Brazilian pandeiro. Is that correct? Uh, it's one of my main instruments. It's my one favorite of, instruments, yes. One of the several main instruments. Um, and Amy uh, plays with a group called Grupo Falso Baiano here in the Bay Area. They're uh, a short row group that performs all over the place. And she also collaborates with all these world-class uh, musicians from Brazil. And we'll talk about her projects coming up too. Um, so tell us, uh, Amy or Lorca, either one of you can go first. How did How did you get started playing drums and percussion? Go for it. <laughs> um let's see well um <laughs> been been a while now um but uh i think my dad who i didn't see that much growing up i didn't grow up with him uh but he sent me out a drum set when i was about eight or nine um and I remember opening it. I really had no idea. I think I opened some of the stands first, and I was like, what is this, a telescope? You know? <laughs> <laughs> when I first saw some of the hardware. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess, you know, my mom had told him, like, yeah, I think, you know, he's got some rhythm or he's got, you know, I guess she felt that I had some, you know, potential. <laughs> um, and so... Um, yeah, he sent me out some stuff, and um, that that was the beginning of it. Yeah, and and tell us who your dad is. So my dad's name is Billy Hart. He's, uh, um, you know, a, a fairly well known drummer, right? especially in the jazz world, and he's been based on the East Coast um, for pretty much his whole career. He's still very active. Uh, both as an educator at Oberlin and New England Conservatory, as well as, you know, he's continuing to tour with groups like the Cookers and um, his own quartet. And, um, mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, he stays. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And Amy, how about you? Um, much later for me, uh, I grew up um, not in a musical family at all, and I played piano as a kid. Um, my mom decided to get rent a piano and everybody tried and I really liked it. Um, but then in high school, I, I wanted to learn how to improvise and I wanted to learn jazz. And, you know, we just didn't have the, the mental or understanding of how to access it. So I stopped. Um, so when I went to, I went to UC Berkeley for my undergrad and I, had always wanted to play xylophone or something with mallets. Oh, and yeah. there was a steel drum jazz ensemble, like elective. Um, so I took that and then I got into the West African drumming over there and, and mm -hmm. like a lot of drumming, wonderful, like Afro Cuban, um, West African, all that kind of stuff um, going on in the East Bay and at Alice Arts mm -hmm. too, East Bay Center. Um, and then I was just kind of hooked. That's where I really started taking classes. 
And were you just you were just drawn to to that style of music, like you mentioned Afro Cuban and Brazilian and stuff? Is that just like that's what pulled you you in, right? It was like this is what I want to do. You know, or was it an instrument? Was it like a certain instrument, maybe? No, at that point it wasn't an instrument. It um at that point it was friends. You know, I I ended up finding a bunch of friends. Uh, there was a there was a guy in my dorm named um, Jerry Barr. And he was like, you should come to this West African drumming class with C.K. Ledzekpo in Berkeley. So I went and I met some of my best friends there. Um, this guy, Chris Fisher, um, uh, Alan Potosnik, uh, this other guy, Garo, who now lives in L.A. And they were drumming for a lot of the Afro-Cuban dance classes and stuff like that. So oh. they became friends. And, and when I wasn't in school, we were pretty much drumming all the time. Um, but I didn't get serious about it until probably uh, a year after I graduated college. I went down to Brazil and um, I spent about nine months down there. And that's kind of when I came back and, and uh, got a little more serious about it. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So in Brazil, what were you like exposed to that? I mean, obviously the, the music, but what what exposed you to it that you knew that that's what you wanted to do? Um, I ended up, so I, you know, I, after, after I, gra I graduated in, um, conservation from UC Berkeley mm -hmm. and I got an internship. It was a paid internship at Union of the Concerned Scientists and it was a nine month thing. And so I, uh, I knew I wanted to go to Brazil. I had a friend who had spent time there and I signed up for like a language course for a month. Um, you know, a family homestay kind of thing. And I went to Salvador Bahia, which is in the Northeast of Brazil. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, you know, like the heartbeat of Samba Hege and Ache and Afro-Brazilian culture. It was the first um, capital of Brazil before Rio. And, um, or now, I'm sorry, uh, musical capital. And then now it's Brasilia. But it was like oh. the, the first center where the Portuguese colonized Brazil, really. And um, anyways, I ended up studying there and meeting people. And I, I stayed and taught English. I met some expats that were leaving so i took their their kind of thing up and i ended up getting into a really weird story but i was drumming with an all woman's drum group and i ended up uh, i was the only non-brazilian but i got to perform and play for like carnival and this festival they do called the lajin de bonfim and um and it just was like it was amazing I did not want to leave or come back. I can say that. <laughs> you've I remained, bet. Amy, ever since then, you've been you've remained super connected with a lot of the musicians in Brazil, right? You have a, a really big project that's coming out that you're working on right now. Can you tell us about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, fast forward, I ended up going to uh, I ended up going to graduate school at the California Institute of the Arts in LA and I got an MFA there. And um and I ended up meeting two Brazilians there that introduced me to Choro and more Brazilian jazz. And, and there was an uh, instructor there, Randy Gloss, who really got me into the pandeiro. Um, and so it, it, it went into there. So choro and samba are, are a big part of my life. And I ended up a few years ago meeting um, Rogério Souza and Adinho Gerber for their project Duo Violin, which means two guitars. Um, and I became a third wheel. And now it's Duo Violin plus one. Um, and we did an album called Historia de Choro, which shows like a bunch of different elements and we were on tour with that album when COVID hit and so oh, yeah. we had a grant to do a project here and we turned it into a virtual thing but instead of just doing the video we ended up recording a lot of the audio between here and Brazil so we're gonna make that into an album this year so fantastic I can't yeah. turn, oh, turn lemons cool. into lemonade that's fantastic yeah <laughs> Amy, for those of for those of our listeners who aren't familiar with the Pandera, do you have one handy that you can show them what it is? You, if, if you guys don't know, Pandera, is it some kind of bread? <laughs> <laughs> you put peanut butter on it, or yeah, is it, it is it? No, it's, it earns you bread. Yeah. Oh, it earns you bread. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So this, is, so it looks. Everyone sees it. Says it looks like a tambourine. It is a tambourine, but it's um, you know, uh, Stanton Moore, a really well known drummer yeah, yeah, uses sure. this on his kit and LP, which I have an endorsement with actually makes um, an, uh, a pandero that you can attach to your drum set. So as a, as a Tom, um, but this right is on. a little, here's a little bit. So you get the 
a tunable oh. side of it. That was awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You guys, it's amazing. I've seen Amy play, and I've played with her several times, and that thing is like a drum set in your pocket. I mean, it, it, she can make all different kinds of sounds out of all these complex grooves with multi layers of rhythms on it. It's pretty amazing. I know, man. You know my favorite part about – Oh, sorry, Bart. No, go ahead, Rick. Go ahead. I felt the kick. I felt the snare. I felt yeah. the hats. Right. All, exactly. all in one. Exactly. My yeah, favorite part of cool. that was when you started playing, all five of us were like, we're all grooving. Man. <laughs> <laughs> all of us just kind of started grooving. That was yeah. fantastic. That's great. Yeah. Way to go. So, Lorca, um, you just released, I know not too long ago, you had a CD come out uh, of your own trio that was called The Color CD, which is a fantastic album. Um, and you have yet, yet it just, it feels like that was yesterday to me. And then you've got another one coming out like in a few months, right? Yeah. Well, I know, in some ways it, it, it still feels like yesterday. I mean, it's actually been out um, almost a couple of years, but because of COVID, I mean, I kind of released it in April. It was like yeah. April 1st of 2020. And so um, I had some, you know, some nice, Kind of CD release dates lined up and all that kind of went out the window. Um, and so it's, yeah, I mean, I haven't been able to kind of get it out there like I, like I uh, would have liked to. Um, so, um, but anyway, that's actually, we just, <laughs> the band just kind of had uh, our unofficial CD release. It was the first gig I'd had with, with the band from the Colors CD um, about a week ago at, at the Bach Dancing and Dynamite. Oh, so the CD release was two years after the CD came out. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people have been run into that, you know. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. ran into that. Yeah. Records out. We're ready to tour it. Shut down. <laughs> yeah. That's just it's just what it what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. Been a challenging time, and. Uh, but actually, two weeks ago, I was down in LA and recorded um, the next the next one, which will be out hopefully by the end of the year. And I, I don't even have a I have a working title right now. And it's kind of um, it's basically going to be dedicated to some of the great masters, jazz masters who have kind of passed during the last couple of years. Not necessarily because of or from COVID, but just mm -hmm. kind of. Uh, you know, over the last couple of years during this period. So, um, yeah, so I've got, you know, to the McCoy Tyner tune, Chick Corea tune, um, wow. Stanley Cowell tune, um, actually a beautiful arrangement of this, uh, Ennio Morricone, you know, the oh. composer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tune. I love Ennio Morricone. Yeah. 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 So we did a beautiful tune of his, uh, from the untouchables movie, mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, a couple originals and um, yeah, that's my trio and then featuring a uh, wonderful sax player, actually from the Bay Area, Dana Stevens, who's mm -hmm. been based in New York now. Wow, yeah, he's great. And uh, Nicholas Beard, a wonderful vocalist uh, who's, who's here in the Bay. So anyway, yeah, looking forward to getting that out. Uh, that's Amy, can, fantastic. Can we see the CD again? Oh yeah. Let's see. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously well, with, with COVID and stuff and, and the sax player living, I think you said it was a saxophone player living in, in New York. Yeah. Um, and so you're recording every things virtually and sending out tracks and whatnot. Do you, do you find that, do you like recording that way? Cause that's what I do that in here in my studio, I record and send tracks out. Do you like doing it that way? Or do you prefer live in the room with the musician vibe, especially jazz, you know, jazz kind of, you know, yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, well, actually, with with both of these recordings, I mean, this the colors was done before, you know, before right. COVID, okay. um, before and uh, and that was actually with the, the the sax player on that one. Ralph Moore um, is actually based in L.A. So, we were all, and actually, this latest one that I recorded two weeks ago was also all in person. So, oh, um, okay, good, so, good. Yeah, so yeah, that's. Um, I think I mentioned I did mine remote. Maybe that. that Maybe that's what I heard. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Well, there with you, did, Amy. Do you do you like do you? How did you feel about remote versus? I mean, does it make a difference? Uh yeah, it does. <laughs> I mean, there's 
I think I figured if we were going to do it remote, I mean, in some ways I went into a studio though. That was really, mm -hmm. I, I, I did, um, you know, I've done some pandemic recordings at home. I got my home studio more up, but going into the same studio I'd recorded with, I mean, that was the benefit. Like we did our album with um, Jose Dio Nadino in um, El Cerrito at a great uh, engineer and bass players um, spot. What's for lunch with Dan Feisley. So I, I went that. there and I was able to, and that he already knew the sound. He already knew what we needed. And so it was super easy. And then we also worked with Celso Alberti, mm -hmm. um, who's a great drummer and also yeah. an engineer. And so that was really, really helpful. So, I mean, the benefit was we used, I went big or go home. So we have like 17 musicians. So I was able to access people wow. in Brazil that I probably wouldn't had it not been for the pandemic. So, right. you know, it's, it's unique kind of thing. But in general, no, of course. I love the vibe of like everyone together, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, I, Lork, I'm, I'm always curious about that because of the recording stuff that I do, you know, here out of the house. I mean, it's 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 cool, but yeah, when you have that vibe playing together, it's just better. And being like a, a world percussion type of thing or a jazz type of thing, I can imagine that it's it's really different. You know, I would, I can only imagine something like that just being completely, you know, the mm -hmm. vibe being hard to grasp. I think when you're playing is the way I would put it. Is that correct or no? What do you um, I think what I noticed was talking to, so the guy that I keep referring to, Jose de Souza, is he's like, a, he's an amazing producer, composer, arranger from, from Rio. He's part of like a, a regal family of the Shoro and Samba tradition he's played with bottom powell uh he's played you know paulinho de, de viola like he's played with greats and 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 right. what i thought was interesting was i think for him and some of the brazilians there it was even more strange it was really new it was so i think for myself i love having the metronome and my headphones and and all of that but i think for for that was what was interesting was hearing how different it was for um for them that's yeah. yeah it was really a new experience yeah they would yeah. not be doing it that way otherwise yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. So i have a question for you guys um all of us um on the show are performers and we're educators and i think we can all say that that we're trying to get our younger students or newer students to start appreciating and understanding jazz and brazilian and all world beat music and um can you guys give us a starting point or how you might take a student, maybe a student who knows rock and roll, and you're going to try to introduce them to jazz or Brazilian or you maybe some bands? Question. Great oh, question. I'm sorry. Well, great minds. This question was brought to you by Chipper. No, this is great. I'm, I'm trying to hear the answer. You want to? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, I think... I mean, it, it can be challenging, of course. I, I think, you know, I think with many younger players, though, I, I think, you know, there's there's a certain appeal and a certain attraction to, to improvising and soloing, you know. So I think if you can kind of kind of maybe you know, lead with that a little bit yeah. and say, check out that, you know, what, regardless of the instrument, I mean, whether it's a guitar player, a horn player, a drummer, you know, um, and kind of, you know, kind of lead with that a little bit and like, you know, Hey, check this out. I mean, you know, check out, you know, whether it's, you know, Papa Joe Jones or Buddy Rich or, you know, Tony Williams or, you know, or more contemporary stuff, you know, Dennis Chambers or, um, but, uh, you know, kind of leading with that and then kind of getting into the, you know, the, 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 the fact that jazz is, is, you know, is, is more, um, you know, it kind of includes naturally includes more improvisation, uh, in, in its overall form than, than maybe other genres. Um, so anyway, that's what I would say. I, know, I think that's great, Lorca. Cause I think that if, if, if a student is approached with that, like, hey, man, you can just do your own thing. 
it has to be relative to the song, but you can do sure. your own thing. Well, how appealing is that? Right. So that's, right. that's a great thought. I think I think a lot of people will, will listen to that that so thought look, and maybe get into it more. Look, are there certain musicians or drummers specifically or albums that you like go to as touchstones for your younger students? Yeah, I mean, I think kind of, I mean, I mean, I try to always go back to the, I mean, you know, sometimes hitting them with more contemporary stuff may be a way in, but then mm -hmm. kind of trying to go back and say, okay, well, these guys probably were checking out, you know, this stuff and trying to really find some roots in the tradition, trying to expose, mm -hmm. you know, them to, what, I mean, what's the you point? know, Max Roach, mm -hmm. of course, is, you know, Philly Joe Jones, Art Blakey, um, you know, and even before that with Papa Joe and, um, you know, um, yeah, Buddy Rich and Louis Belson. I mean, <clears throat> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think for me, Max kind of, I mean, Max Roach kind of bridges so so much. And so that's always a big one, yeah. you know, a big one for me. Yeah, what's, I hear I hear a lot of Max in your playing. I mean, oh. in a great way, yeah. I His phrasing, say. <laughs> His phrasing was just amazing. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's just amazing. Hey, Lorca, Lorca, when you're working with a younger student, I don't mean to take the questioning backwards, but when it comes to students that are being introduced to time and staying steady and keeping a rhythm, what it, do you have a curriculum or a favorite jazz book that you direct them to, or do you have a process which you use with newer students? Great. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, depending on the level, especially the reading level or familiarity with, with reading. Um, I mean, lots of times I won't even start with a book, you know, necessarily. I'll just start with a simple, you know, eighth note on the hat, bass drum, snare, you know, kind of very basic patterns, right? Just mm -hmm. trying to get basic independence and some mm -hmm. kind of groove that they can feel um, and uh, and then, you know, trying to start with some basic rudiments, singles, doubles, paradiddles, um, and trying to introduce the metronome, you know, pretty soon, you know, pretty early to try to, I mean, at least with the, with the rudimental thing, just trying to, 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 to lock in with some kind of steady pulse, trying to kind of, have that feeling, internalizing that that feeling um, of playing with a steady pulse, um, and then you know, then the Wilcoxon book, you yeah. know, that's I try to get into that fairly early. Um, mm -hmm. so as far as a jazz book, um, that's you know, I. I, I Usually I kind of wait a little while, but then I mean I, I like the I like the Riley book a lot, you mm -hmm. know, John Riley I book uh, for popping exercises and you know, yeah. um, kind of getting some some jazz independence. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, anyway, yeah, that's. that's how about, maybe, how about what Wayne? about Europe? Oh, go ahead, Chip. I was just going to ask Amy the same question, but regarding her style of music. Um, do you have a fundamental path or a curriculum that you would introduce younger players to, you know, how to, how to deal with those time changes and various rhythms from Brazilian music? Yeah. Um, you know, there's two ways I look at it. One is, you know, going to Cal arts in the world music department where there was the John Bergamo, Randy Gloss, and, and a lot of like um, Indian influenced music as mm -hmm. well really kind of influenced how i think about the time um i love playing in odd meters um and things like that and i think there we really looked at you know john cage steve reich like different kinds of uh pieces so i like to bring it down to just twos and threes counting i i, I that's one thing for just rhythm elements is mm -hmm. really i love the the fact that in Brazilian music you're using 16th notes, I think it's really an easier way to teach sometimes non-music reading students. Because a lot of times with the world music or ethnic music genre, you get folks who don't read. So I think sometimes introduction to reading rhythms is um, 16th notes are great or using like South Indian 
kind of um, counting is is helpful. And just breaking it down, like what's a, a Brazilian seven is always going to be four plus three. It's never going to be three plus four, you know, things like that to hear, um, to hear that kind of thing. Um, could you, then, could you demonstrate that count? Like, especially yeah. the South Indian counting, because I, I know it's way different. I'm like, which way do I go? You know, the, just oh. using, there's, uh, there's like, there's, well, there's different methods, right? There's the, there's the, like, tuck it, tuck it, tuck it, tuck, you know, there's the syllable, syllable. Um, and, you know, in Brazilian music, there's a lot of mnemonics, too. So using kind of mnemonics to hear that, like, one, two, three, taqueta, taca is one, two, and things like that. And then you can count if you count. can't get my – how do I do this? If you get your – you know, you, they count their knuckles, right? So you can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So it's a nice way to practice. Like, if you're doing a five against four, you can – Interesting. And, oh, okay. Nice. That, that's cool. Amy, the, ah. I, I know that like traditionally, uh, like a lot of the percussion instruments like congas and uh, bata, cajon, pandero, all these instruments are, are have a tradition of being taught by, by ear, right? Yeah, and, I mean, I know, think... I think the thing for the Brazil, like then to bring it back to, to like, how do I teach, let's say drummers, right? Like I'm sometimes working with drum set players. And the biggest thing for me is if you've grown up in a jazz band and you've gone to a college or a community jazz band, you've probably learned your like Latin tune and your mm -hmm. bossa nova, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. your introduction to Brazilian music. And so yeah. Uh, the the thing I start with is talking about the surdu, which is on the two beat two, boop, boom, boop, beep, boom, right? You have the not on the accent on one, and then the second thing is really talking about their you know binary rhythms in the African diaspora, right? Like a six eight or twelve eight bell, clave, the Brazilian lavada they call it, which people or the bossa nova pattern that people call the Brazilian clave. Mm -hmm. are all binary rhythms. They have a downbeat side and an upbeat side, and you can cut them in half and mm -hmm. and, and move them around. And so I, I I sometimes try and, and really dissect what the Brazilian levada is um, that you'd hear in a samba school and, and what it's different about clave. It's so different than clave in mm -hmm. Cuban music or salsa. It's the okay. same because you have a down and an upbeat side and you use this as a as a rhythmic phrasing that your improvisations kind of have to follow. You can't be out on improv like jazz so much because you have to kind of be contained. Um, but there's a little bit more freedom in the in the Brazilian levada. And so I, I, I start to dissect that way. That's really cool. Um, I, I've actually seen you teach a little bit. I've had been able to take your class at uh, Casadero Performing Arts Camp where all three of us have taught together. Um, and Amy's a, a terrific educator. But where I was going with that was uh, you've written a book about uh, Pandero. And, and that's, I think, if I'm not mistaken, like, his, like historically, that's mostly been a tradition passed on by ear. But yeah. you've written a book about it, and for, for me is great because it, that's part of, that I, I learn a lot through books. I'm a book guy. Uh, not everybody's like that. Some people are more learning by ear, and you know everyone's got a little bit of a balance, maybe. But can you tell us about your book? And 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 you know, seems like it's a really welcome addition to the to what's out there. Oh yeah, um, thank you. It's uh, it's a Pandero book on. Um, in fact. Here I'm so sh I'm so shameless. Look at me. No, that's, so yeah. 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 that's what this is about. That's <laughs> why your website in the comments. If anybody's yeah. watching, <laughs> interested in either of these artists, go check out their websites. It's in the comments. Could you hold it up longer, Amy, so yeah. we could see? Yeah, the, there the it title is again. Sure. And that is that. And I'm so, basics. Is that, is that a Mel Bay book? It is almost a Mel Bay book, so it's going to be published by Mel Bay. And it was so right. late on my deadline. They were very gracious um, because of, you know, we, we have an 11 year old. So there was the Zoom school and all that during the pandemic, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's almost ready. Um, but yeah, the, the difference, there are, there are some Pandero books out there. Um, my issue with method books, when you're learning a non-American, a non-Western, mm -hmm. you know, I'm American. I had to learn all this from teachers who were Brazilian and, 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 and not, but who really steered me in the right way. 
um, is you have to learn about the culture and you have yeah, to learn yeah. about who the players yeah. are and what the what song was the influential song that changed the you know evolved the genre. Yeah. And so that's what my that's what this I hope has is a little bit of that. Because sometimes the method books just have the rhythms and, and you don't always know how or when to use them. Well, um, I'm so glad you said that because we, we've had other uh, educators on here talking about that. Daniel Glass was talking about um, how, you know, if you just teach <laughs> patterns and not songs or not how these parts relate to songs, you know, drummers are missing. We're, it's like we're, we're raising a generation of drummers who don't understand how they're playing fits with music. You know, yeah. unless, we're, unless we're thoughtful about how we do it and put it in context and understand, you know, the progression of, of, of how the playing evolved and how it fit with the music differently. And that John Bonham listened to Gene Krupa, you know, like we were talking about earlier, earlier influences. Yeah. So that that seems like it's a really, a really great thing to have in your book. I mean, for me, I mean, I, I, I can barely play the Pondero. I've, I've only taken a class or two on it. But it, like it's such a giant black box mystery you know i see this thing and i want to learn these patterns but i don't have any context for it and i think that would make it all come together in a really cool way so that's great looking forward to checking that book out when it's out on out in print yeah can i can i ask Lorca another question he, sure. he mentioned you mentioned some monster drummers and some greats of of the genre of jazz and, and Amy just talked about songs that elevated the genres. Do you have any specific go-to songs that you introduce to the younger kids? Any, anything specifically come to mind? Um, so, great question. Um, uh, wow, specific songs. <laughs> um, I know it's it's easier to think about artists or mm -hmm. or, or records, but specific songs. Um, you know, I mean, I I often go back to the to the you know Max Roach and Clifford Brown record, which has mm. so many great great tunes on it, um, where Max is you know soloing on pretty much every tune. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, whether it's uh, whether it's with brushes, mallets, or you know, um, pretty much regardless of tempo, you know, he, he gets to solo on every tune, which is great. You know, tunes like Joy Spring or, or Daoud or... Uh, what what record is that? What's the label of that record? You know, I'm forgetting the label. Um, is it uh, just Clifford <laughs> Brown and Matt Roach? LRC or... it's I mean, it's an old... I mean, obviously, it's probably, you know, been re-released or co-opted on a, a different label now. But... Um, yeah, Max Roach and Clifford Clifford Brown. Right on. Um, it's uh, yeah, it, it's that's the the title. Um, and they have a couple records, or two or three records with you know kind of the two of them. Is that um, it? That's what? the one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Or so, MRC. Right? Is it MRC? MR, is it this one? Wait, I'm looking it up right now. See if we can find um, it. I really, um, I really like to know that because <clears throat> I've got some students that are in the cusp of this transitional phase of where they're getting into jazz in school, and I'd love to have something to knock their socks off. Yeah. Okay. I found it. Hold on. Um, it's. I'm trying to just show you the picture of it. Here it is. I can hold it up, or at least it's this I one. I got that. Okay. It just says Clifford Brown and Max Roach, album by Clifford Brown, Max Roach Quintet. Got it. Similar. Yeah. That's hey, Lork, awesome. Lork, I, I, yeah. I got a question for you. Shifting sure. topics just a little bit. Um, you're, you, I think of you as really one of the the top uh, jazz drummers in the Bay Area. I know you're you're super humble and you're like, oh, come on, you know. But you know, every time I, I see people gigging, you know, <clears throat> who's who, like, and I look at who's on the gig. Oh, there's Lorca again. There's Lorca again. So, you know, you're you're super in demand uh, jazz drummer, and you know, you, you you travel up and down the West Coast for gigs and sessions. What advice do you have to younger drummers or maybe sort of, you know, aspiring drummers, let's say, uh, to, to keep busy as a sideman? Like, how, how do you get all these gigs playing with all these different artists? Yeah, that's I mean, that's a that's a great, great question. I think, um, you know, I mean, obviously, there's a, I mean, there's a, a big part is having a certain level of facility on your instrument and um you know, and but also I think a, a huge part is kind of actively trying to be a part of the community, you know, and, and going out 
and supporting people going out, you know, checking out music as much as you can. I mean, you know, going to jam sessions, of course, but just kind of being around so people know that you're into it. Like, oh, cool. I just saw him or, or her at this, you know, this gig last night, checking it out. Or I just saw them, you know, uh, you know, hanging out at the jam session or doing this and that. And then it's like, okay, well, you know, gradually it's kind of like, okay, this person must be pretty serious mm -hmm. and they're checking out the right stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like, okay, well, well, let's give them a shot or, or, you know, see what they're about. Um, or have them sit and, in, right? And, uh, yeah, right. Exactly. So, um, that, that's great advice. I mean, I don't think anybody's ever said that before on the show when we've asked them about, you know, how to, how to grow your career and get gigs. I mean, you're, I think you're the first person who said, go out and see gigs. Yeah, yeah, I think that's you know. I mean, then you're you're if you if you want to play with these people and you're wait you're sitting around waiting for your phone to ring, you know, that's become a member of the happen. community. Right, right. Probably won't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. 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 Just, yeah and just by I think sometimes just listening. You know, I mean, we like that's, we've already mentioned. You know, some people learn by by reading out a book. Some people learn by you know absorbing it through the ears. And I think that's just a great way to learn because not only do you hear what the drummer's playing but you can stand off and and watch what they're doing and yeah. how they're you know and it's a great way to learn i mean just to to you know watch yeah, yeah. most mostly when i see lorca play i think how do you do that how do you do that how do you do that that's what i was doing just this morning i was watching his live stream i was like what is going on there <laughs> <laughs> I think I was probably thinking the same thing. You know? <laughs> what is happening? What is happening right now? <laughs> you know? I, another question. I, I have another question for Amy. As long as we're as to not to go backwards on Jeremy's point, but songs that elevated the genre. Do you have specific a specific album or a CD that you kind of use as a go to to younger students or people that you want to introduce to that? I mean, I, yeah. Is there an sure. ambassador song or something like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, if you're, probably nobody on this Facebook Lives even, maybe even knows what Shoro is, but I, I don't, it's such a, um, it's such a, it's before Samba there was Shoro, right? And they evolved together, but it's Brazil's first music, uh, Mashishi and Shoro. They're like, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, kind of like evolved at the same time as American ragtime. So oh. you know, if you think about how influential and important ragtime is for jazz, you can then say this is, you can't really have the samba without knowing about Shoro. Um, and and for me, they're, they're well, Pishinguia is, um, is, I'll have to write it in the chat. It was huge. There, there. I mean, that he elevated the music and actually went to Paris at the time of Scott Joplin and all, when all those people were going to Paris in the 20s and 30s and really became a national hero for Brazil. So he's like the godfather of soul. It's it's amazing. Um, and then after him, Jacob do Bandolim, who played the Brazilian mandolin, kind of re revolutionized the music and made it really like Charles Samba. You really can hear that Samba swing in the music. Mm -hmm. um, and he's more around the 1950s, if you will. And then um, for the Pandero, there's a guy named Marcos Susano who grew up listening to Police and Zeppelin and American rock and was trying to figure out how to do the drum patterns on the Pandero. Wow. So he is like, wow. he did an album with this guy, Lenin, L-E-N-I-N-E, -E, where it's okay. just Pandero and this singer-songwriter, and it blew up, and you will not believe there's not a drum set on that album. Um, really? No kidding. It's wow. so, and I, I remember I just like over and over and over what, listening. What was the to album's that. name? Um, oh, it's it's a weird name. It's got, hold on. That's I, okay. I found Marco Susano. I'm going to look it up. Just I'm look Marco look it up. Susano and Lenini, and it's something of the fish, I think. I have to, okay. I'm, um, so that's that. And then for, you know, for Samba, I think what I always refer people to is, you know, if you're coming to Brazilian music from having a little bit of Latin or salsa or, or, or Latin jazz kind of vibe, I always say, you know, the guitar is so important to Brazilian music. It's just the thing, it's playing the percussion and the ride that you hear that you call the 
Brazilian clave, which Brazilians call the lavada. Um, and so I think there's Baden Powell, you can't go wrong because right. he kind of re brought the Afro Brazilian vibe um, and the real samba back to Bossa Nova, which had been become kind of, you know, it, its whole purpose was to de emphasize the percussion, change the harmonics, elevate the vocals. Right. Um, and so he really re kind of rhythmicized the music there for the song. Right on. Yeah. Amy, cool. could Thank you clarify you. the difference between a bossa nova and a samba? Uh oh. So, Great so often, question. Thank yeah. you. So often I'm listening to a song or a student brings me a song, <laughs> and that's a bossa nova beat, but the title yes. says something samba. Okay. This is such an easy question to clarify. Okay. For Brazilians, bossa nova is a variation of samba. Boom. That's Boom. it. It That's is a it. samba. It's just a so you can play a bossa nova more sambado. You know, you can play it more um, syncopated too. Where like if you have that lavada, I'm talking about that. Right. That's how you think of the the bossa nova. The tambourine part is like. Or if I do it on the upbeat side, it's. And more contemporary sambas will start on that upbeat side, like you know, where you're really feeling the E of one. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Bossa nova is a variation of samba. Yeah. I like I that. For, Got it. for us, it's a variation of jazz, right? But for Brazilian, it's just a variation of samba. Now, now within those, is there a little sway and play with the swing, the different degrees of swing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I'm going to refer you. Um, so they they call it the fork in Brazil. So you have your four, like, doing the thing again. Okay, the four 16th notes. If you kind of push these together, uh -huh. right, you end up having the fork where you have the, the you know, that's what, I don't know, what, what do we call the fork? You know, when you have the, I'm like, my mind is drawing a super blank. When you have this, right? You have this. The two notes oh. in the middle are, are pushed closer together, yeah. oh, resulting six, in a shuffly. 16th, 8th, 16th. Yeah. Ba, 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 right. Yeah. One A and. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 16th, 8th, 16th note. Um, like a swung 16th. But that, can you clap that? that, that clap that again. Could you clap that again? Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Right. Very can you, cool. Can you demonstrate it on the pandero for a second? Well, uh -oh, here we go. Right, here's the thing with the pandero. With the pandero, you're playing all the 16th notes, but... When you a lot of times I think where we get the 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 gringo like the American like not swingy swing is that we're thinking bossa nova so we're thinking one e and a uh, two e and a uh, 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 and it's too heavy it's dragging it back where when I play the pandero or even I play a shaker I'm really emphasizing the e if I emphasize the one e and a two e and a I sort of get that four that 16th eighth 16th so that's so here's the difference i'm trying to play right this feels really heavy yeah but that's a different swing yeah 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 you're accenting the e beat yeah you know so oh, I, yeah <laughs> oh. so i always say i yeah, i've if you get a shaker, just think of like one E and a two E and a one E and a two, and then think one E and a two E and a, and that'll really train your yourself. That's what's so hard. Very yeah, cool. Yeah. Do you and it's get to back when you're playing. It's back, together? right? One E and a two E and a three. I think yeah, a one. I think, and then I yeah, and that's mm -hmm. the thing, right? Is that all? Michael Spiro, one of my teachers has, you know, made that comment once that almost all music from the diaspora never starts on one. There's always a pickup. So I'm thinking yeah. towards me is the O, out is, you know, out. So O, one, E, and a, two. So here it is. Uh, 
a one e and a two e and a one e and a two e and a one e and so towards me and out. Okay. A one e and a two e and a one. Yeah. So I don't know cool. if that's a good example, but that's great. no, that oh, is that is example. So. As you guys can see, I have a shaker right there, but I don't want to embarrass the hell out of myself. So no, I'm no, we're going to part the show. We'd like to you to demonstrate for us what you've just learned in the last five minutes. <laughs> I'm just going to I'm going to sit here and shut up for once in my life. Well, I'm just going to be, be quiet. Yeah. Do yeah, you guys, as, Amy, Amy, do you get upset when a singer grabs a tambourine or a shaker? And <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you, Chip. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, I, I actually did a class with a great, um, a great singer in the Bay Area named Sandy Cressman, and she, she teaches at the Conservatory of Jazz, and we did a, a percussion class for vocalists because she's got a project called Homagem Brasileiro and um, or Brasileira, and um, and we were talking about that. It's if you know what you're doing, it's amazing. So mm -hmm. you know. Right. Better same yeah. For, same yeah. for horn players, right? You could like, say that for every instrument. Any, you know what you're doing. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's like when Jeremy was going through an airport once. Tell him your brush story. I love this story. I, I, I had my stick bag and I, they put it through the x-ray machine and the guy opened it up because he never didn't know what, what was in there or what he was looking at. And he took everything out, like every stick and every mallet and every brush. And he, he understood what the drumsticks were, but he didn't know what the brushes were. And he said, what are these? And I said, these are brushes. And he's like, are they dangerous? <laughs> and, I said, yeah, and, and I said, only if you know how to use them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Uh, so, <laughs> Amy, we, I, we have about 15 minutes left, but I have to ask you about um, music is first. So, so Amy's involved with this this nonprofit that you actually started, right? Um, that's involved with with bringing music to elementary schools and and doing programs all across the Bay Area. Can you tell us about awesome. that? Awesome. Oh gosh, yeah. Um, when I in brief, when I lived in LA and I that's where you know Lork and I met. Um, I I had some great training working for the LA Philharmonic and the LA Music Center Center, um, and I was an, a teaching artist. So I went out and taught and with the LA Phil, I got to really start writing curriculum for them, uh, which was great. And uh, every year, new curriculum, lots of funding, wonderful free programs. It was, it was really wonderful. So um, I ended up meeting my director, Allison Swihart. We'd both worked for other groups and, and I'd started doing consulting for organizations like Living Jazz or SF Jazz. We're helping them oh. get started with, um, branding curriculum for students that they worked with. And we met and we had a mind meld because, you know, the data shows that your biggest influence of music is in early ed. So our group Music is First brings music residencies to underfunded preschools, um, public preschools that wouldn't otherwise have a music program. And we tie into literacy. So that's kind of my, wow. my, my day Fantastic. job, if you will. And, and that's when you bring when you say you bring music to those kids, you're talking about just like the very beginnings of making sounds. Right. And putting rhythms together. It's not like there's no Brazilian. There's no like styles per se. It's like uh, or is there yeah, we in the sense? Yeah. You know, what's really interesting about it is that like uh, one of our partners is Daily City here. It's just south of San Francisco. Um, we also work with San Francisco Unified and. You know, like one year that I worked with Daily City, they had 13 home languages spoken in the classroom, right? Wow. So there's such a diversity. So our curriculum is pretty diverse. We try and represent the languages spoken in the classroom um, and bring materials and really kind of, you know, sometimes like we just finished branding um, images for head, shoulders, knees and toes, <laughs> but showing different uh, world cultures, because a lot of times if you search for these early ed songs, you'll get real tinny, you know, produced music, or you'll find imagery that's pretty white. So right. that's kind of one of our missions on the side is bringing the standards to those kids and then also bringing like, you know, what are, what are some of the songs that you learn in uh, Jamaica mm -hmm. as a kid growing up or what are songs, um, you know, so we have kind of a big, a big, a, a big mission. Right on. There's a link in the comments. You can go visit musicfirst.com. They've got all kinds of stuff on the website, place where you can donate and jazz lessons, all kinds of cool stuff. Thanks. 
Yeah. And I, I do have one more thing to ask you about, Amy. I know you're involved with this really amazing <laughs> festival that you produce. Um, <laughs> but it's something about frame drums. What, 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 what is that about? Um, <laughs> well, I met this, this great drummer, Jeremy Steinkohler. Um, uh oh. Uh oh. At, at Kaz. And as you, I don't know, do you talk about that you also play the Boron? They know. I, I've admitted it to them in private. No, not yet. He came out. He came out. He came out. Yeah, so, so we are, we're going to do it. We started it and then the pandemic hit. So we're trying to really cement this, the Bay Area Frame Drum Festival. And so we had one virtual showing during the pandemic where we had um, the Indian Rick and we used a gospel tambourine, Pondero and a frame drum. And we're going to do it this year. And just so you guys know, Rick is an instrument, not a person. The Indian I Rick was, is a, a drum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rick goes up there and everybody beats on his head. It's really cool. <laughs> We had the Brazilian Jorge, the Indian Rick, the, uh, the <laughs> Jewish guy, Jeremy. <laughs> sorry. sorry, sorry. That is so cool. Well, I got to say, I bet you I bet you dinner at your guy's house, Thanksgiving dinner, has just got to be amazing uh, for, for musicianship and different cultures of food. Now, please don't let me down. Let me know. Yes, it is, Bart. We have food from all over different cultures it's just i want to dream a little <laughs> my best that we don't say anything just imagine it yeah. <laughs> we kind of like yeah. go ahead go ahead now lork is a really good cook actually he grew up in new mexico so we tend to to have that he so he cooks really great food from new mexico. oh where, where in new mexico taos Oh, okay. My Northern, my stepmom, yeah. my stepmom lives uh, on the Isleta uh, reservation outside of Albuquerque. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I I love the food out there and the the fresh Indian bread and the ovens. You know? oh, oh yeah. my gosh, yeah, I could good. just gorge myself on that. Yeah, that yeah. stuff's great. Yeah, we yeah. usually do when we're there. Yeah, the green chili and oh yeah, yeah. So a so chili fun. sandwich. You make chili sandwiches. <laughs> You got to be from New Mexico or be around people from New Mexico to have a chili sandwich. You got to yeah. that. Yeah. So chili on everything. I've, got, I've yeah. got a question for you guys, and this is something I've wondered about. I mean, it's rare to find husband and wife uh, or, or partner couples who uh, are both performers. You guys both tour. You guys are both educators. You guys both perform and record all around the Bay Area. And you also have a son, a really terrific kid, Leo. Um, how do you, how have you, has, how have you managed to balance that, you know, all these years with both of your touring schedules and recording schedules? And it just seems like a big challenge. Not, not for the faint of heart. Yeah, know. right. <laughs> That's for sure. I, I mean, I think there, I mean, I think like when Leo was a baby, I didn't play as much. You know, right. I mean, you can't do everything all the time. The, yeah. There's no way <laughs> as, a, as a parent, as whatever. So, and I think there were years where I, I focused more on, um, music ed than I did on performing, but then it always comes back and I do mm -hmm. a project and um, right. it, I don't Do you guys ever perform together? Not, not anymore. Not much. We <laughs> And that's the secret to the happy marriage. Yeah, I was just going to say, there's the secret. That's a secret sauce. You play over there, I'll play over here. <laughs> in some, I mean, it's, we laugh about it, but in some ways that's true. Yeah. I mean, you know, having our, I mean, it would be wonderful to, to do more together but it also yeah i mean we're kind of in in different genres different scenes and, and yeah i mean it does in some ways enable us to the fact that we have our own kind of things going they don't probably clash as much as they would have schedule wise uh, i mean and so. sometimes we have to say no and it's yeah. who has the better gig exactly right right yeah, yeah. Well, I can seems, imagine. I can imagine. Just that would be fun be having a... dinner. You could talk about clave at dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Break and like Lorca said, you just got to imagine that, Rick. You just yeah, got to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right now we're, we're talking a lot about, let's see, uh, Rock, our son, is obsessed with uh, Bandworks, which Jeremy is the nice. you know, founder of. And so we're, yeah. we're talking a lot about rock lot about and roll. 80s rock. Yeah. 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 Reliving our. Are you? Are you? Leo came up to me the last time I saw him and was asking me if I knew about uh, 
you know, which Van Halen album was like the most influential or something like that. He was like I've done a deep. Nineteen eighty four. Yeah, that that was that was yeah. the one that was for me. But anyways, he's, yeah, he's, I was he's, a fair he's, warning fan. He's, he's been deep I, diving, I loved all of yeah. them. Yeah. What's that? He's been deep diving into you know, I mean Van Halen, and then into yeah. A lot now of he's kind of in a nineties grunge. He's going through a punk. He's yeah, he's going through. Alex Van Halen, man, that dude's no joke. That guy can think, play. Oh, my God. Yeah, I think it's drum. good that he's going from Van Halen to grunge because you don't have to get four bass drums. <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. So, guys, I have a quick, quick question about, about streaming versus CDs. Do you think that that we're seeing a big difference in in sales is it was it better when it was all cds or is it better now with streaming it's always better when it was cds i think yeah yeah i mean yeah i think that's it's hard to argue that i mean obviously any i mean no pun intended any income stream is 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 better than you know nothing you know than nothing but it's yeah i think the the cd sales it's hard to compare you know a, a, a spotify you know point oh 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 one you know cent versus you know yeah. a, 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 a cd yes you know, yeah. So, yeah it was cool to see that you put out a cd I think most independent artists are nowadays. And a lot of people, like the album that I'm doing right now, I want to put out vinyl. I think a lot of people are yeah, I was gonna say doing some vinyl. Yeah, because well, there's all the audiophile people. And, they, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. I think that, and I think if people really like your music and they, they may want to help support it, you know, by buying a CD or a record. And vinyl's fun. I mean, vinyl is, it sounds amazing and it's, you know, it's cool. Also, if you want to get played on the radio, you still have to make a, you have to press a CD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's, I, a, it's a calling card. Yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. I still buy, I still buy CDs and records. Yeah. Me yeah. Too. yeah. Right on. Very good. Well, you guys, I am so, we all thank you very much for coming on the show today. It's been really great to talk to you and hear your stories and thanks for sharing your time with us. And um, what an honor. Yeah. Is it, is thank it you. Really been an hour. This went too quick. Yeah. Well, we'll have to have I, you guys back on. Yeah, I got to say thank you so much for all the information and the and the music. I'm going to go ahead and watch this again and write down some of those names so I can help teach my students more about both of those genres. So it's been a great show for me to be a part of. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so grateful we've been anointed with this technology. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Yeah. You got it in. I almost yeah. threw it in. I almost threw it in there, Chip. Thank you I was so waiting much. for it. That's just I didn't want to steal too. your. Sh well, hey, I you know what? I have I an idea. It. Go ahead. I'm just. I said I mean it. I, I'm sincere about that. I'm very grateful you guys have been on this show. Thank you. Thank, yeah. thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. Hey, you know, I have an. I have an idea. Next week's guest, uh, Dusty Watson, is polar opposite. He played in punk bands forever, and he played in on the first lead of Ford record, and he was played with Dick Dale for like 21 years, but him and his wife, Ricky, Ricky's an amazing drummer and she oh. plays with a lot of, lot of the punk bands tours all over the world with it. That would be a great show. Another one, like one of our, one of our round tables that we do, you know, where it would be a hus husband and wife teams. That would be cool. Would you guys come back if we did something like that? Sure. Anytime. Yeah. Anytime. Yeah. Awesome. Like family feud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could do a deck family feud. We could ask drunk trivia questions. Yeah, right? Right. drunk trivia, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Your face is. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, Lorca, what's your idea of a perfect groove? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, that could really be dangerous. Yeah. 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 That could be. That'd be a little dangerous. Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, I love it. Anyways, thanks, you guys. Love yeah. You, guys. Thank, you know, and thank you for doing on. this. I just want to say, I mean, as far as just for, I mean, I think we had a blast, but also this is so important for, for the community, you know, creating a sense of community amongst drummers and, you know, amongst musicians and amongst 
people that do what we do and love, you know, love what we love. And uh, it means a lot that you guys are taking the time and, and making this happen. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Guys. Our pleasure. Yeah. Our pleasure. Thank you guys so much. You're a wealth of knowledge and wonderful people. And it's just so great to meet you. Thanks. And I'm serious. I do want to come over for Thanksgiving dinner. I really do. I really do. I'm just going to imagine Bart coming over for Thanksgiving. I know. It's probably, Lork is probably right. I'm just, I've got this whole thing in my head that I'll just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> keep it. Keep, keep, yeah. Keep the fantasy alive. <laughs> <laughs> what do they say it's not it's yeah. sometimes you don't want to meet your heroes or something like that right exactly <laughs> <laughs> that's great right. that's fantastic well, that's it for us you guys thanks so much for joining right. thanks for watching everybody. everybody thanks for the chiming in on stuff <laughs>